Michael Corbett has been City's CEO since 2012. City is one of the largest consumer and investment banking groups in the world, with 200,000 employees in 160 countries. After 37 years at City, Corbett recently announced he'd be stepping down as CEO, handing the reins to Jane Frazier, who will become the first woman to lead a big Wall Street bank. I'm here with City CEO, Michael Corbett. Mike, nice to see you. Andy, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. So let's jump right in. I want to ask you about the latest earnings report. You guys beat expectations, especially with fixed income and equities trading. Um, how has the bank weathered COVID-19? Well, I would say so far we've, we've come through it, I think, in a, in a very strong fashion. And I think Throughout 2020, we've continued to demonstrate the significant earnings power of our franchise, which has um, shown itself in terms of, at this point, three quarters of the way through the year, revenue growth of 3% despite uh, the crisis, a strong quarter net income of $3.2 billion, $1.40 a share. The underlying um, diversity of our business model, I think, has served us well. If you, you look in there, you mentioned um, the, uh, the performance of our markets business, fixed income business up 42%, equities business up 8%, our banking business up 13%. Consumer banking not doing quite as well as some of those other areas you talked about, number one. And number two, the stock has also lagged a little bit, the market and some of your peers. Um, what's the explanation there? So uh, I'll start with the consumer banking piece. I think clearly um, from an industry, not just a city, but an industry perspective, obviously uh, the revenues in that business remain under pressure due to the impact of the of the pandemic from a city perspective that's manifested itself or shown itself predominantly in the declining credit card spending. Credit card is a big business for us. Uh, a big part of uh, our client spend uh, historically has been on the travel and leisure space. And so we haven't been able to, uh, to obviously escape that. But I think at the same time, um, through the programs that we've offered in terms of forbearance and, and other things, I think we've seen a, a consumer, not just here in the U.S., but around the world that's in many cases, or in many ways, shown phenomenal resiliency. We see savings rates up. Uh, we see delinquency and we see uh, credit charge-offs actually at levels below where we were a year ago, I think which many people w- would, would believe and uh, cite to be, uh, to be extraordinary. Um, and, and again, in this quarter, um, uh, you know, from, a, from a, an income perspective, our consumer franchise made $1.4 billion despite those, despite those, uh, uh, those, uh, those challenges that are out there. I, I think, Andy, from a, a share price perspective, um, you know, that city's performance relative to other banks has varied through the crisis. And, you know, that that could continue uh, over time as we move past this crisis and demonstrate our resiliency. And again, I think the way we've come through the past nine months uh, has has shown that so far, we believe the stock price will adjust uh, accordingly. Uh, back in March, along with other U.S. banks, we took the proactive step to suspend share repurchases to further bolster our capital. Our capital is up at a 11.8% common equity tier one ratio and, and obviously gives us a position of strength. Uh, we continue to, to, to pay uh, our dividend. Uh, we got a 51 cent per quarter dividend that we, you know, we came into the crisis paying. We, we continue to pay and you know, we're, we're committed to continue to do that. Mike, I have to also ask you about uh, the fact that City was fined $400 million earlier this month for lacking adequate risk controls and entered into a consent order with the Federal Reserve. Should investors be concerned about that? Well, I would say first that, you know, we, we are disappointed that we've fallen short of our regulators' expectations. And uh, as we've said very publicly as an institution, we are fully committed to thoroughly addressing the issues identified in those consent orders. Uh, as part of that, there are four main areas of, of focus in there. Uh, around risk management, data governance, controls, and compliance. And I think what, importantly, what ties these together is, um, you know, the, uh, the, the need or the you know, desire to continue the modernization of our infrastructure, our governance, and our process. 
and we uh, have had remediation programs in place. And while we've been making progress against those, we're simply not where we need to be. And, and we acknowledge that. You've seen Black Monday, 9-11, 2008, 2009. How does this downturn compare to that? Well, I, I think first, Andy, we need to recognize kind of what this is. And, you know, at its core, this is a, uh, a pandemic. It is a health crisis and uh, will not be solved until we have a, an answer to that, till we have a health answer to that. Clearly, a manifestation of this health crisis is uh, significant economic challenges, not just here, but around the U.S. So I think different uh, from some other crises that have affected the financial markets. Uh, the financial markets are not at the center of this, right? It is, it is a, a derivative effect of the health pandemic. And I think the, the, you know, the, the great news or the silver lining in this is that I think the, the financial system globally, and in particular in the U.S., comes into this as a source of strength. We talked about capital, we talked about liquidity, we talked about reserving. And I think very importantly, what's different this time uh, in particular from the last crisis is the fact that um, the banks and in particular the big banks, right, have played a very important or the very important role as that um, transmission mechanism between government programs, fiscal monetary, whether it's central bank or, or broader government programs and the real economy, right? So whether it was the early days of the crisis when the Fed was injecting liquidity or they were putting in place certain types of lending facilities and liquidity facilities for the markets to take advantage of, it was the bank in, in particular the big banks that actually really brought those to life. So how would you characterize the U.S. economy right now, and how critical is another round of stimulus at this point? Well, I would say that um, the U.S. economy has actually um, performed better than expectations, right? If we if we take a look at you know what you would think would be happening around GDP, around unemployment, around the challenges of of individuals, families, small business, bigger business, uh, I, I think. You know, so far, the programs that have been put in place by the Fed, those programs that have been put in place coming out of Treasury, I think have, have served us well. Um, what we don't know from where we are is what the forward trajectory looks like. And so I, I think right now we're all trying to watch the data to see that as we head back into colder weather, as we head back into flu season, do we actually see a, a, a continual uptick or resurgence in terms of, of COVID cases? cases. Uh, of, as of late, we, we've seen a bit of that. I would say in some cases that was expected, but really what we want to see is, again, we want to see that curve turn and bend and start to go back down. And, and clearly, um, I think we, we all have optimism and there's a lot of work going on in terms of um, the, the vaccine and the antivirus out there. And, you know, hopefully that's not in the, that's, not too far in the in the future, and that we can get that out, we can get that scaled, and we can give people the benefit of that, so that we can start to have a a, a more uh, expedited return to normalcy. Our willingness to to use mass transportation, our willingness to to go into crowded space, our willingness to go indoors into a restaurant. I, I think all of those things are critical. From a stimulus perspective, I, I think without a doubt, uh, people recognize that uh, there that we probably do need another round. I think we've got the ability to be more targeted this time in terms of those businesses, those geographies, uh, those, uh, the, those areas that uh, have been more acutely affected by the virus. And um, I, I think at this point, it sure feels like to me, it's, it's not about are we going to get it? It's when will it come and uh, exactly how, how, how will that be designed as we go forward? You mentioned the Fed, and I want to ask you about Jay Powell and his policies, and specifically about negative rates, Mike, and, and how concerned are you about that, or maybe you think that's something we should turn to? 
Well, I would say I would say one, Andy, is that as a, a a company, as a bank that operates all over the world and a hundred markets all over the world, uh, we've experienced negative rates. Right? We've seen them in Europe, we've seen them in, in Japan, we've seen them in different places in the world. So negative rates aren't uh, while they while they might be new to the U.S. when they come, they're certainly not new uh, to a company like Citi and the way we operate. Uh, I, I would argue, and I think that um, Chair Powell has has argued and argued this and or stated in his testimony that um, the transmission uh, mechanism of negative rates um, isn't necessarily that effective in the places where we've seen it. I think it, it creates strange behaviors. It creates strange bubbles. And um, I would say, you know, hasn't, hasn't in, in totality been all that successful. I think what I've heard is Chair Powell has spoken is a uh, uh, a uh, reluctance to go there, and uh, I think you know kind of feeling that there's maybe some other tools in the toolbox that uh, could be more effective. I think as an example, away from the Fed, I think moving away from the monetary side of things being the answer, maybe taking a harder look at what type of fiscal programs. You know, we've had a lot of talk about infrastructure, or other things that are out there that could actually provide a lot of benefit broadly across uh, the U.S. economy or other economies. And so, uh, again, we're, we're in unprecedented times, and I think that we should continue to to think and act creatively in terms of how we attack this. And for me, negative rates is is probably not uh, not from what we've seen the the, the 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 next or best place to go. Right. Are you guys at the bank concerned about a contested election? Have you guys discussed what that might mean for capital markets or the functioning of of lending or just the bank's business? You know, it's a it's a scenario that that people talk about. Um, and I would say that it's you know, kind of one of the things that we, we, we are and certainly will be uh, keeping an eye on. Um, uh, again, we are a, a, a political institution and, you know, the people speak, the people vote. And, um, you know, we, 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 we certainly respect that, that process. Um, in, in terms of you know, kind of market disruption or, or how that plays forward, you know, hopefully, um, the the results are clear, whatever they are, and hopefully there's a smooth transition around that. But again, I think the the markets and city will certainly be prepared. Uh, and you know, I would you know this year we we've gone through uh, unprecedented periods of volatility of volumes, and I think the markets have stood up stood up very well to that. Talk about your employees and your teams working from home and how you manage that with such a large global, as you say, institution. What's that been like and, and how's it going? Well, we've, we've got uh, around the globe, as I said, you know, operating in about 100 countries and territories around the world. We've got about 200, a little over 200,000 employees, um, you know, at the at the peak of working remotely. We had the vast, vast majority, 90 percent plus of our people. Uh, working remotely. And I would say that the investments that we made in systems and infrastructure so far have served us really well. And my uh, operations and technology colleagues have done a great job that, you know, during peak periods, we've had an excess of 150,000 of our colleagues in our systems, you know, working online uh, through the city systems. And, you know, they've, they've stood up stood up very well. And I think that, you know, a year ago, if you and I would have had this conversation and said, and, and I said, you know, let me tell you what we're prepared for. And let me tell you what I think, you know, we can do the kind of numbers I'm talking about. You probably would have wished me well, but probably thought I was a little bit crazy in terms of uh, the ability to do that. Well, I, I think here, here we find ourselves and, uh, and, and that in fact has happened. Um, it is our, it is our goal. It is our objective to, to get our people back uh, in the office safely. And as part of that, we're, we're being driven by the data. It's not about a date, it's about the data. And so again, when you look at the places we come to work, we've probably got about 60% or a bit over 60% of our people back in, in China and Taiwan. We've got over 30% of our people back on average across, uh, across Asia. And I would say in Europe and the US, we're probably more in the low single digits to low teens. Looks like the chief executive is back a little bit. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I've uh, I've I've been back for uh, for a while, and um, again here here at headquarters, we probably got somewhere about ten ten twelve percent of our staff in, and and obviously that um, 
you know, depending on the trajectory of things, will uh, continue to continue to come up. But I, I really commend our people in terms of uh, the work that they've done and the safe environment that they've created for us to return to. In September, you launched a one point a one billion dollars in strategic initiatives to address the racial wealth gap. Um, why did you do that? Well, you know, I, I that you know clearly. Um, the events, not just of this year, but you know how things have have um, have moved or lack of movement over time uh, certainly hasn't hasn't been lost on us. And when you think of cities' central role in local economies and the financial lives of Americans, we believe that we can have a significant impact on helping in, in this case to address and to close the racial wealth gap. So in June, as protests for racial injustice, uh, uh, racial justice intensified, I challenged cities, business leaders, my team to develop solutions that, you know, we could go at and attempt to tackle systemic racism in our local, in our local economies and, and communities. And the announcement we made, Andy, around our action for racial equity uh, was our response. And, and, you know, what we did in there is try to go at this with a pretty comprehensive approach to providing greater access to banking and credit in communities of color. By the way, what we do, right, that is our day job. Increasing investment in black owned businesses, expanding home ownership among black Americans. And if you go back the last 10 years or so, we have, while not being the largest bank or the largest real estate bank in the US, we have consistently been the largest lender to the low and, and moderate income housing across the US and so that we thought you know we could bring some ex expertise to and uh, and obviously advancing anti-racist practices in the financial services industry so in our billion dollar commitment 550 million dollars to support home ownership for people of color 350 million dollars in procurement opportunities for black owned businesses so so as a company that manages uh, big businesses and you know we spend a lot in our communities we obviously have the ability to to drive that spend uh, and to push that spend uh, and, and really try and uh, support black owned, uh, our, our black owned su suppliers. 50 million in impacting investing for uh, capital for black entrepreneurs. Uh, again, kind of reaching out there, 100 million in support for the minority depository institutions, right? The minority depository institutions operate in a number of these neighborhoods that have been significantly affected in the, in the COVID pandemic and ways that we can support them. And whether that's with monies, whether that's with lending support, whether that's helping to provide them uh, expertise or, or, or other things that we can do uh, to help them to help them uh, continue to, to build their, their institutions. And finally, $100 million from our foundation and grants to support community change agents for addressing racial equity. So, um, you know, real, real money, real tangible actions. Uh, we're excited as an institution around it. We've already begun to, to get out there and to kind of put these monies and to put, and to put our efforts to work. And um, the, the institution is completely behind it and I think excited by it. And finally, uh, Mike, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about this major changing of the guard that is taking place right now. You're leaving the bank after, okay, I'm gonna do the math, 37 years, right? That's right. 37 years, and Jane Frazier is taking over as the first woman to lead a major U.S. bank in February. What's your legacy? What can we expect from Jane? How's the transition going? My thinking was influenced by uh, a, a few things, right? One is going back to 2017 when we did our big investor day, we embarked on a three-year plan that would take us through the end of 2020, and it's kind of always been my ambition to, to see that through. Um, uh, second, as you mentioned, I have a ready now successor, right? Jane has been with us for, for going on 16 years. She's had a number of jobs across the organization. She and I have worked always very, very closely uh, together. And, you know, in many ways, we've been, you know, preparing her for quite a while. Uh, as I kind of think about um, the accomplishments or kind of what happened uh, on, on my watch, obviously coming out of the crisis, we increased city's net income from around seven, seven and a half billion dollars to over 19 billion dollars last year. We um, 
uh, more than doubled our return on assets in terms of our portfolio. Our return on tangible common equity went from about 5% to north of 12%, closing the gap with, with our peers. We went from returning hardly any capital in 2012 to returning nearly $80 billion in capital to our shareholders in the last six years, and we've reduced our share count by about 30%. So, and I think all of that hard work and uh, what what we've done so far, I think, is you know very positively manifested manifesting itself in terms of how we're we're coming through COVID in terms of our performance of of our resilience, and I think the the you know trajectory that the firm is on. So, um, uh, I'm proud of I'm proud of what we've done, and I I'd say I'm very confident in terms of the great management team we have in place, and I know Jane's going to be a fantastic CEO. And we wish you well. Michael Corbett, CEO of City, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.